Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Central Valley Talk. Three minutes away from 1230. It is the 30th of March, so we have two more days left in this third month of 2022. I am Austin Reed. Hit me up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Austin Reed on air. You know, this hour has been devoted to introducing you to some of the Central Valley's finest political leaders or pol politicians uh, that, that are running because we, we've got some elections uh, coming up. And joining us is our next guest. He is Dr. Myron, Myron L. Hall, and he is running for U.S. Senate. Yes, Welcome, sir. good to meet you. Thanks for having me. Hello, for having me. how you doing? I'm blessed, I'm blessed. You, now you were telling me that you know you come through Fresno from time to time, but this is but you're here in the Tower District today, getting your kind of first first look at more inside the Fresno area. What do you think? Yes, it's a it's a nice quaint um, city. I like the uh, residential area. I had a chance to drive down by the community college. Uh huh. Yep. Um, a different feel, you know. I, as I share with you. One of my favorite things uh, after living in Sacramento for a year for my last year of residency uh, and discovering the state fair is to do road trips from Los Angeles or the Inland Empire up to Sacramento every summer and visit the state fair and experience that great uh, activity. And one of the key stops is Fresno, and the <laughs> Motel 6 sign is yeah. my cue. Right, right know, off the 99. I have, I have food, <laughs> gas, and if I need to, a place to stay. But I usually right. just, you know, make a pit stop and uh, either keep going north or south. So let's talk. Let's. I, wanna, I want um, our viewers to get to know you. So let's, let's begin with, with your story. Where are you from? Where were you born? And, and how did you get to where you are today? Well, it's been a beautiful journey, uh, not always easy. Um, I was born in Ohio. My parents divorced when I was four. Uh, my mother was from Florida, so she moved us, uh, my sister and I, uh, back to where her mother was staying in Tampa, Florida. Um, she remarried a uh, Army uh, sergeant in the 100 Air, uh, First Airborne, uh, First Airborne Division, and we traveled around, lived in six different states and Germany uh, when I was growing up between the ages of uh, four and 12. Um, they had a tough marriage. He was an alcoholic and mm -hmm. she divorced again. Um, but she always pushed me to do as good as I could in, in school. So I was a pretty good student and a uh, pretty good athlete as well. What as sports I did you play? I played basketball and football primarily oh, nice. and picked up baseball. I was a little okay. scared of the ball, but uh, I, I'll never forget this, which is kind of foreshadowing uh -huh. to me being a doctor. Um, I was scared of baseball my first year playing, but uh, because I was so good in basketball and football, uh -huh. the baseball coach, you know, recruited me to play baseball. Yeah. So he had a special team with a bunch of my friends that I went to school with. And so I joined the team, uh -huh. but for the first three or four games, I didn't hit the ball at all. I was like over. I was the leadoff guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was the fastest yeah. guy on the team, but right. I was... I was actually closing my eyes every time the ball was pitched. So they took us to the batting cage one day and he just, he took the bat away from uh -huh. me. He said, you're not gonna hit. I just want you to watch the ball and the machine throw the ball past you. Uh -huh. And know, get that confidence that it's not gonna hit you. And it was that type of tutelage that helped me build confidence as well as my mother saying I could, I could do anything I wanted to do. But that coach, who's now passed, was, he was also an army sergeant. Uh -huh. So he was very, very stern. Yeah. But he preached confidence. And so the next game, I left my cleats at home. Okay. And my mom showed up at the game with my cleats in a doctor's bag. And everybody started calling me Doc. And because I'd had that little confidence boost, uh -huh. I went four for four. <laughs> oh, my. See? The, wow. It was the doctor's bag. Nobody right. knew I was closing my right. eyes the whole right. time before that. But I guess that, um, that goes yeah. to show you that positive reinforcement, confidence. Oh yeah. And yeah. and knowing that you know what? I can do this. Right, right. And and most importantly faith. My mm -hmm. mother was a Christian okay. and from the time I was uh, six, five or six I was in church with her. She was a choir director. Okay. So she instilled uh, Christianity and faith, which is the, the basis 
uh, the base of all of my confidence and ability to per persevere through things in life. After I turned 12, my mother divorced again. Okay. Uh, as I said, my stepfather was an uh, alcoholic. And um, she, you know, she was a single parent, raising two teenage kids, um, or kids going into junior high and high school. Um, by the time I was a senior, I had, you know, had very good grades, all A's except for two B's and a C. And uh, my mother lost her house between my junior and senior year. Okay. Uh, so that that made the home environment very unstable, uh, and certainly it made my final year challenging. I had a lot of opportunities that fell through that I would have, you know, uh, have loved to explore athletically and academically. For example, Notre Dame. I had letters from them, um, and and I was beginning to feel like I, my opportunities had evaporated. But there was one thing that that. Uh, my mother held on to and she fought to get me uh, connected to the Naval Academy and I got into the Naval Academy prep preparatory school in Rhode Island and one year later I had a congressional appointment to the United States Naval Academy and that that perseverance that my mom had and love for the country and desire to help me to get to the Naval Academy saved my life so I'm forever indebted to this country and um, I think we need to bring back the hope that, that this, the flag used to have and, and the opportunities in this country used to provide for people. Well, especially, I mean, right now we're seeing what's happening in Ukraine and, you know, uh, whenever, whenever somebody's like, oh, I hate America, and it's like, well, I know we have our problems, <laughs> but at least we have freedom. Well, we, we have the freedom to pursue happiness. Mm -hmm which was delineated in the Constitution um, and has been the bedrock for opportunity and success and prosperity in this country, not just individually, but as a country. And I think some of that was lost, has been lost over the years. And you brought up the Ukraine. Uh, first, let me just uh, say that I've been praying for the Ukrainian people, um, also the Russian citizens. That, right. uh, they've been suffering. Some of our companies, which where they work, have been closed. Um, um, I think we need to pray for peace. Uh, there's been a lot of civilian casualties, which is which is a travesty, um, a big travesty in that whole situation. Um, but the war has illuminated the fact that we've given leverage um, with you know, our decrease in energy production here in our, our country, and given that uh, energy leverage or leverage in the energy sector to Russia. And it likely emboldened uh, Russia, gave them the, uh, the finance to proceed with this war. So, you know, um, I, you know, just hearing what you're saying, um, you are for, let's, let's make everything in America, you know, as possible? I mean, like, do we need, we need to work on being able to uh, pump oil here? Or, you know, like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, certainly, if you just drive up the coast, which, which I just did from Los Angeles to the Central Valley here, uh -huh. just in the state of California, you can see the vast uh, land and resources we have um, just pass through the the uh, raisin capital of the world. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> down there in Selma, I yep. didn't even know that. I yep. saw the sign. Yep. Yep. All the almond trees, um, the vast resources in agriculture, even here in a state that's not seen as an agricultural state, like California, um, and certainly that holds true across the country. We're probably, if not the largest, the one of the largest uh, resourceful. Uh, resource-laden countries yeah. in the world. And so with that, I think we should work to manufacture and, and produce so that we can be self-sufficient. And as a quote-unquote world leader uh, of the free world, um, I, we need to be um, efficient economically. We need to be a mass producer, producer across the board um, and that holds true for, you know, in technology mm -hmm. and in agriculture. 
um, with the war, it's a little bit illuminated that Russia and Ukraine make up 30% of the world's grain exports. We have enough to, to eclipse that here in this country so that when, you know, uh, countries that don't have, you know, a democratic system in mind take advantage or are aggressive, other countries that are our allies aren't, you know, aren't uh, necessarily beholden to them because of the economical exchange that they have for these resources and um, supplies. So I want to talk a little bit now about your move to California and um, and and you you becoming a doctor. Yeah, it's a it's a long story. Um, I joined the Navy after uh, finishing the Naval, United States Naval Academy uh, in 1988. I went on to become a, uh, a surface warfare officer, regular line officer, served in Desert Storm, Desert Shield, uh, did uh, anti-drug operations uh, on an anti-submarine warfare ship out of Charleston uh, for three years. Uh, was serving at a pretty high level, um, was an officer in charge uh, during Desert Shield uh, in the Mediterranean and Red Sea um, on a tactical action oiler. And we serviced the ships uh, coming to and from um, the Red Sea and, and going over to support Desert Shield. Um, had an outstanding career, ended up uh, with an opportunity to go anywhere I could go. Uh -huh. And the detailer said, well, we have San Diego and we have recruiting. You can go back home to Nashville or you can, which is where I ended up going to high school. Yeah. Or you can go to San Diego and recruit. I was like, I think I'm going to California. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> San Diego. I had been, I had been uh, to tre uh, Treasure Island. Okay. Uh, when it was open, it was the uh, one of the Navy's firefighting uh, training uh, uh, schools. Yeah. So I had uh, like a two month uh, stint there, and I fell in love with San Francisco and California. Uh, so I want, always wanted to come back after that. So I was able to recruit. So in the early 90s, I got a, a, uh, an opportunity to go back to San Diego and recruit. And I did that for three years. I was the department head for recruiting officer programs. They recruited uh, ROTC and worked with high schools, talking to kids and uh, helping them with opportunities uh, in transitioning from high school to college. And of course, fell in love with San Diego and, and didn't want to leave. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I ended up uh, getting out of the military. Um, I injured my ankle, but my dream was always to go to medical school. Okay. And as I was uh, recovering from my ankle injury, I studied for the MCAT, got accepted to Temple University School of Podiatric Medicine, and uh, went to Philadelphia for four years. And as it were, I did well in school. And one day, uh, one of the, the uh, instructors said, you know, you're doing pretty well. I heard you're from California. And uh, you should take a look at this residency program. And there was a periodical he had with the picture of my future residency director. This program, coincidentally, was right there in San Diego. And I never knew they had one of the best programs in the country. So I went back to San Diego after I graduated, matched with that program, did my uh, surgical residency there for okay. two years and finished the residency program in Sacramento. So I had time in San Diego and Sacramento. Uh, Sacramento was a very, very uh, beautiful city, yeah, quiet. Is. And it reminded me, it was like being, you know, it was, of course, California city, but it, was, it reminded me of living in, uh, the South. Uh, it, yes. People are very hospitable. I, yeah. You drive yeah. down the street and people wave at you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Sacramento is they, really they cool. They stop and let you in through traffic. Right, uh, right. So I enjoyed my year there in Sacramento and, of course, found out about the State Fair. And I was, I'm like a kid when it comes to carnival. I know, so, I am too. I love so it. <laughs> I lived right there across the street from the expo. And okay. one night I saw the fireworks and my neighbor said, you know, I asked her, I was like, what's going on with these fireworks? It's like every night. It's not the 4th of July. And she said, Do you, you didn't know the expo has a state fair. And I immediately changed my clothes and went over that night oh, and then fine. went back the full day the next day. Wow. Um, and and as a, if it's open and I have time, I usually try to make a road trip up right, there. Right, right. Now, um, so tell me um, why the run for Senate? Well, 
as I said earlier with my own life story, um, the government, the, the, this country gave me the hope uh, and the opportunity with the United States Naval Academy, um, an opportunity that changed and saved my life. I grew up as a military dependent part of my, for the most part of my uh, childhood. I enjoyed traveling to different parts of the uh, country and meeting different people, people from all cult cultures living in Germany. And as a military dependent, I loved, I, I de developed a love for um, what this country means to a lot of people or meant to a lot of people. The pride that people would get and the hope that they had in the flag, as I did when I was a high school student with seemingly no where to go with all of the potential that I had uh, academically and athletically. But having that opportunity changed my life. And as fast forward, as I fast forwarded to our recent times, it just seems that we have a, a lack of quality leadership at the highest levels in our country. Um, we had the Afghanistan situation where we had Afghanistan people hanging off of a uh, off of the Massive U.S. Jet. Air Force yeah. plane uh, as it was taking off, um, 200 feet or so in the air. Uh, just uh, that was an really incredibly bad look for uh, reflection on the leadership in our country, our flag. Uh, we had 13 soldiers killed right outside of that uh, airport during the evacuation of uh, Afghanistan, and that's had me. Um, and so it pricked my heart to mm. want to do something besides just debating with friends and, yeah. and talking to family about how we could better our country, improve things. Um, and I wanted to get into the race and do something yeah. instead of advocating for patients, which I've done for the last 20 years. I want to advocate for the, be an advocate for the American people sure, and, what the we need American. and what we need. Um, I, since you are a doctor, I, I do want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, I was going to ask you a little bit about COVID, but I don't think, you know, I don't even want to go. I, we've, all we do is talk, you know, talk about COVID. It's like, I don't, but. Are we still in COVID? Yes. Yeah, apparently. Is it still a national emergency? <laughs> but I want, but, um, the, the question I do have though, is what are some of the problems you see today in healthcare in America? Well, it's, it's, it's things that we saw uh, prevail um, with the whole management of the uh, coronavirus. Um, there seems to be uh, a lack of consistent messaging, a flow of that information to uh, various parts of, and levels of medicine, and huge bureaucracies uh, within medicine as a whole, and then in individual entities such as hospitals and healthcare systems, um, health ma maintenance organizations that hindered the care and the application of care to the patients. And I think that's a big issue. Cutting through the bureaucracy, allowing the true talent of the doctors um, to be applied to the, the needs of the patient. Now, um, if you become one of our next senators, what are some of the things that you want to work on with it, you know, like right at the get-go? If you could just think of two things. Yeah, first, first of all, you mentioned coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, you may or may not recall there, was, there were two uh, mandates that went before the Supreme Court. One of the mandates was for OSHA, one was for uh, CMS. Um, and CMS is government managed healthcare. So they allowed that to stay, and those mandates pervade, prevailed. Um, however, the other mandate was rescinded and, and uh, it wasn't up upheld because. Um, because they, they actually dis, the, the dissent and the reasoning was is that they suggested that 
the Senate or Congress should have, they had plenty of time to delineate uh, the guidelines for uh, using masks and, and some of the criteria for restrictions. And that hadn't been done, so the Supreme Court sent it back. Um, and so one of the first things I would like to do is establish criteria for uh, certain guidelines within the, the treatment or management of the coronavirus, mainly delineating the criteria for ending the national emergency. Because as long as we have a national emergency, there's going to be the sense that we need to allocate tons of money, which we've done. Right. And that's driving a big uh, factor in driving the inflation that we have. So I want to do that, and then I want to work on managing the budget so that we can get the inflation under control. And then the third thing would be um, getting some type of clear police reform where we actually support the authority and, and bolster the authority uh, and image of our law enforcement. Um, are you ready to have fun now? Yeah. yeah. Five this questions. Is, this has been fun. Oh, well, good. Well, I know, I know. But now it's like, now we get to be really, really excited. Um, Five questions, all right? Number one, favorite NBA team? Favorite NBA team is the, the uh, Philadelphia Sixers. Okay, that's not bad. I loved Allen Iverson, even though I am a Blazers fan. I was there when <laughs> Allen Iverson, I went to school, uh, medical right. school in Philadelphia. Yeah. And I was actually at game seven between the Milwaukee Bucks yeah. and, and Philadelphia 76ers when, when was that? Uh, Matumbo, Iverson beat yeah. Ray Allen and That's those guys. And then they went on. I was driving back across country uh -huh. after I finished med school um, when Allen Iverson hit the shot, the three-pointer, and stepped over Tyron Lewis right. against the Lakers. They won the first game and then got swept. I know. <laughs> oh, man. Not, you know what? That's, I lived in Philly for a little while, too, so I, I, I'm... I'm cool with the Sixer. Right. <laughs> I am. Um, favorite food? Favorite food is chicken. Chicken. Yeah. Chicken. And do you like fried chicken or just any kind of chicken? Or like chicken wings? Usually any kind of chicken, but yeah. I'm becoming a little more concerned about, you know, the weight. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. As, as we get more mature. Right. I like to say as we're getting more mature. Uh, so baked chicken is good anytime. How many kids do you have? Do you have kids? No children. No children. Uh, married? Not married. Not married. Wow, so it's so, just you. So, You've got a lot of time so, to work for so people. So I, I would have a lot of time to, to take care of the American people and exactly. fight for them. Um, favorite musical artist? Oh, uh, that's huge. That's huge. And it applies to California, actually. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I, I fell in love with this state early in life uh, and dreamed about coming here. There's a group called Confunction. It was my favorite group growing up. Confunction was uh, part of the funk era. Okay, okay, in the, cool. In the later 70s, yep. 76, 77, they were really popular. My first concert ever I ever went to was at a local college, Austin Peay State University, in the school I was living uh -huh. in at the time. And uh, never forget that. And they had a song called California One huh. that was uh, talked about um, all the beauty of California from the sunsets yeah. to the, 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 the redwoods touching the sky, the beautiful clear blue sky, and then the Golden Gate, um, just how pretty it was. Um, so they were from Vallejo, California, so Interesting. it inspired me to, to love the entire state. Right, right. It's still one of my favorite songs to just play and ride. I, I'm, a, I'm a road tripper, uh -huh. so I, get, I, you, I collect right. maps and, and road trips, so That's I get awesome. in and put that song in. and, and Driving you down, know, you're happy. Christopher Cross, Ride with the Wind. <laughs> That's I'm, a good song. <laughs> I do like Christopher Cross. Yeah. Now, uh, even the, now, this is going more rockish, but uh, Credence Clearwater Revival, I don't know if you remember that. No, I have yeah, to, I yeah. Have to. They did that song Lodi um, okay. about Lodi, California. But uh, but yeah, um, I will check out Conjunction. Confunction. Oh, Confunction. Okay, yeah. Confunction. Oh, I have something to look up. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, favorite beach in California. Well, the, there's different beaches for different times. Okay. That's certainly, okay. I'll give you a couple. I'll, I'll give you general. Right. So Malibu mm -hmm. is my favorite beach. Yeah. My favorite place is Laguna 
Beach. Uh huh. Very nice. At the Ritz. Not dropping any names for commercials or anything, <laughs> but the Ritz is a beautiful place to go. Okay. Okay. But Malibu has Zuma. It's just it's just straight flat, wide oh. open. It's oh, a it's nice. a beautiful beach. I love that beach. I uh, my wife and I uh, we're going to be celebrating our, our ten year uh, marriage anniversary on uh, May, in May. So and our our beach spot is um, up in like Northern California. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm near, forgetting the name. Near Redding. No, not near. No, it's it's right on the coast. Oh my gosh. How am I? It starts with an M. Um, Mendocino. Oh yeah, Mendocino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yet to go there. Okay. It's oh, one of one of the. You the, gotta uh, check it out. One of the places for my campaign. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Getting north, northwestern California, all the way to the coast, from coast to coast. From coast to coast. Um, what's what's next in the campaign? Um, well, we're hitting this. We're visiting the Central Valley. Um, we want to get up to the Santa Cruz area. The Bay Area is next. I spent a lot of time in my California base in San Diego uh, County, LA County, the first, uh, the last couple of months. Uh, the month of April, I really want to spend a lot of time visiting with the the people in Central Valley, Bay Area, to get to, to understand what their needs are. Uh, and what they would expect or a uh, desire from a, a senator, and maybe what they're they're missing right now. Election day is. The ec- election day is June seventh. Is the yeah. primary? Okay, that's um, Tuesday, right? Yeah. And the general election is November eighth. Okay. Okay. Um, if somebody wants to donate to the campaign or volunteer, can oh, they Sunday, do so? Donate as much as you okay. want. <laughs> 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 and you can go to www.drhallforsenate.com. And we'd love your support. Uh, Doctor, great to meet you. Thank nice you so you much. Too. I nice really appreciate you, it. Keep us updated, okay? Oh, we will, certainly. And Thank good you luck. for having me. All right. I'm Austin Reed. You're watching Central Valley Talk. We'll be back in the 1 o'clock hour, so stay with us.